We are back. Day two. SoulCon. I cannot believe it. Yesterday, Caitlin was so incredible. It was the most mind expanding, knowledge kind of enriching experience I've had in, gosh, a long, long time. You know, one thing I was really excited about is that, um, you know, all of us together making knowledge, creating, co creating together but also doing this without the kind of echo or the soundboard of a kind of white optics. We just were jamming, we were jamming. It was amazing. SoulCon day one was amazing. And um, Caitlin, what do we have in store for day two of SoulCon? All right, everybody, we are super freaking excited. Um, coming off the excitement of yesterday, as Profe mentioned. So whereas yesterday we had um, some student panels and some pro scholar roundtables, today we have some super awesome um, creator panels. We've got four of them today, and we are super delighted that we have our first panel starting right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand off to Morgan Pedreza and once again say a big thank you to Glass Axis, Billy Ireland, um, o ODI, and all the different um, co-sponsors and just support that we've had from folks um, to really make this literally the best SoulCon ever. So with that, I hand it to Morgan Pedreza and here we go with our first panel. All right, hello. Welcome to the first panel of today's SoulCon Expo Day. We're at How to Change the World with a Pen, Comics in the Future. My name is Morgan Pedreza and I'll be moderating this panel. Before we get started, I want to thank all of the wonderful people who have worked behind the scenes to make SoulCon the amazing event that it is. Thank you especially to Caitlin McGurk from the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum and Library for ensuring that the technological side of things runs smoothly, and to Caitlin Marisol Sweeney for her work organizing and planning all things SoulCon. Okay, I'll introduce our panelists and then we'll dive into our conversation. I ask that our lovely panelists wave their hand as I read their introductions. Lexi Ramos is a student currently studying comics and narrative practice at the Columbus College of Art and Design. She loves making comics and hopes to one day finish her very own graphic novel. That's what she keeps telling people anyway, just trying to get it out there into the universe. You just gotta tell everyone because then you actually have to do it, right? <laughs> Juan Agil is a first-generation cartoonist based in Columbus, Ohio. His work ranges from surreal autobio to high fantasy. He has curated and published yearly comics anthologies through Bonfire Comics since 2016. Jules Rivera is a graphic novelist and illustrator. She's done work for Mattel and has just released her first graphic novel with Turner Publishing titled Spectre Deep Six. Her second graphic novel, 200, will be released this upcoming February. Jules also self-publishes her own webcomic, Love Jules, which explores the mind of the badass woman. When she's not arting, she's on a board of some sort. Ew. Xavier Lopez comes from the not so small city of Omaha, Nebraska. Attending the Columbus College of Art and Design as a comics and narrative practice major, he is a major comics nerd that just so happens to draw them. He had the honor to be a part of the sixth issue of the Spitball Anthology and to work alongside other massively skilled comics artists. Xavier is a man of simple pleasures. He enjoys lifting, songs that hype him up, hanging with his friends, and drawing buff dudes. One day he hopes that his buff dudes will make the comics world just that much queerer. Mm -hmm. And finally, Maxi Rodriguez is a plus size Latina currently living in the small town of Norwalk in Southern California. She received her bachelor's in graphic design from CSU Dominguez Hills in 2014 and her MFA in comics from the California College of the Arts. Her current works include Chronicles of a Chubby Bunny, Plus Size Girl Magic, Brown Girl Awkwardness, and Chibi Bunny's Rules of Boundaries. You can find snippets of her work on our Instagram page, and you can read her full comics on Webtoons. So thank you and welcome to all of our panelists. Hello and thank you also to everyone who's attending this panel this morning. So we're gonna get started with our conversation. Um, I think one of the best ways to start thinking about the future and the present is actually to think a little bit about the past. 
Um, so when you started on your path as a cartoonist, what or who, what started you at, on your path as a cartoonist and what or who has shaped you into the cartoonist you are today? We're gonna start with Lexi. Uh, hello, uh, I think what really helped start me is when I was younger, my grandma introduced me to a lot of like animated movies. Like she was really into Ghibli movie so I got to see like Spirited Away, Kiki's Delivery Service like when I was younger and then movies like The Secret of Them, uh, Watership Down, I was probably way too young to see that but uh, and The Rescuers and after like being introduced to like animation and stuff I was just like well art's so cool and I told my parents I was like hey I want to be an artist and they're like okay cool so I've just been super lucky that I was born into like a really supportive family and just from there it just like kept going and just like I'm going to be an artist yay sort of thing but that's it Jules how about you oh okay all right I didn't know if I was next um okay I'm sad to say I have the exact opposite story as my co-panelist I didn't have a supportive family they were just like whatever i mean they didn't like say no don't do art but they also didn't say rah rah sis boom ba like i just landed the biggest job of my uh career right now which i still can't talk about sorry about that um and they're just like meh and i'm like whatever stay over there um <laughs> so um i i got into cartoons and stuff when i was a kid watching saturday morning cartoons and really the only cartoons that held my interest were x-men and the tick because they were actually challenging and interesting. Everything else was like cartoon cat bull crap. It was terrible. Um, oh yeah, and I grew up in the 90s. So um, once Sailor Moon came on TV and turned everything into a sparkling crazy nightmare in my life, I was like, no, this is my jam. So I became kind of an anime girl and um, comics, uh, drawing comics, you know, was, I always wanted to do storytelling um, you know, just kind of with visuals, you know, like, you know, Sailor Moon or X-Men or something like that. So I got into just drawing web comics because I discovered, hey, you can just do that and no one can stop you. And I'm like, cool. So, um, yeah. And uh, I, I drew comics all through my uh, day job. I drew comics up through my education later on because I might, my education was a little flipped. I got an engineering degree and then I went to work for six years for a defense contractor which you can read all about in my Love Jewels volume. That didn't go well. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there's, um, there's a bit about that. And then after I got done with the contractor, then I started becoming a full-time artist. Um, I've, uh, I've since self-published a few books, as you can see here. They're gorgeous and lovely, Love Jewels. And uh, we talked, you mentioned Spectre Deep Six. This is Spectre Deep Six. This is a lovely uh, graphic novel. I've, I've done a lot of stuff. Pass the ball. Bouncing off of that, I have a similar upbringing. I started out with uh, Saturday morning cartoons, um, a lot, a lot of anime. <laughs> so Sailor Moon, I remember running home to, you know, from school to home doing that, which was a, a very quick run because it was right after schools came out. Um, Dragon Ball Z, that one took me all the way through high school. Um, but I, I specifically remember. Um, starting out like it clicked that I wanted to start drawing when I saw like card capture and like all that kind of flour flourish like designs and especially love the um the card designs especially just really like something sparked um and Dragon Ball Z obviously but <laughs> but um and then after that I just kind of uh, I didn't actually get into comics until maybe about after high school uh, because it was such a huge mountain, uh, you know, the big two, uh, to climb. And, um, I remember my first one that grabbed my attention was, uh, the quiver from, um, uh, the arrow. And, uh, it, and then it's just been from there for me. Juan, how about you? Um... I started doing more like illustration and fine arts uh, just through like school. Like I wanted to do some extra credit, easy, easy credit while I was doing other stuff. And 
I, I went to the art class and I was drawing and I always liked drawing, but I never really took it seriously until I was taking like AP credits and stuff. And I was like, oh, this is like a real thing that I can do. And um, I think like influence wise, since then it's been mostly like film and stuff like that. And a lot of anime, like everyone else and video games. I think like the first comic I actually drew was like, a really long, really bad, like Zelda anime fan fiction thing that I wrote like while I was in high school. And it was just like this really long thing, but I did not touch comics until like, like ever since then, I don't really think I made a comic until college, like where I was like in a class and like everyone was making comics and illustration major. And I was like, I'll try it out. And it kind of just derailed my entire like <laughs> curriculum <laughs> into comics after that so it's definitely been like more of like a pickup thing than like a i've been wanting to do comics since like i was a wee bab or something like that all right maxi how about you so um i i think i had a weirder i had a weird start um two people actually pushed me in the path that I'm in now. Um, the first one is my mom, because uh, uh, her job, they used to deliver newspapers, and um, her boss knew I loved comic strips, so she would get the comic strips out of the newspaper and be like, here, your little girl, so she can read them. And uh, my first comics were actually Calvin and Hobbes, Garfield, The Peanuts, and um, at this time we were living in San Pedro, California, and I was just like maybe six or seven. And my mom worked in downtown San Pedro and there was this bookstore not too far from her job where I would just walk there. And that's when I got introduced to Wonder Woman. And I remember just like going crazy because I thought she's beautiful and she's tough and I ran to my mom and I was like, mom, look, is this possible? And she's like, oh yeah, have you heard of Superman, Batman? And I'm like, there's more? So she introduced me to the X-Men. She had me watch all their cartoons as a little kid. She even had me watch Linda Carter's Wonder Woman. Um, but at the time I didn't consider cartooning as a career path um, until I graduated from Cal State Dominguez Hills um, when I found out there was a master's program at, um, at California College of the Arts. But at the time I was working a part-time job at a amusement park while looking for a job in my field. And eventually I did find one, but it was only temporary. So I was let go after seven months and I remember the second person, my mother-in-law, I call my mama Buddha, she approached me <laughs> after I got let go and she's like, what are you gonna do now? I said, I guess I gotta keep working at this amusement park until I find something <laughs> in my job. And she was like, what about that master's program that you were considering in San Francisco? And I said, I don't have the money for it. And I explained that I was discouraged to apply because of the money issue. and my mother-in-law, and I'm going to repeat what she said in English, she said it in Spanish. She was like, put it in God's hands. You're going to grad school. We will figure out the money situation. So she actually pushed me to apply for the master's program. I got in, and then from there on, she kind of just like pushed me, encouraged me to just do all these comics. Um, she would find me here at my desk six in the morning <laughs> just like asleep and she'll just bring me like coffee or or something to eat or she'll be like hey little girl go back to bed I'm like oh. <laughs> and that's how I, I got into comics that's great I love hearing about all of your influences and your child selves and what you were thinking about as you grew into be the amazing people you are today so turning to the present, 
Um, today, we are 53 days away from the next presidential election. We are in the middle of a major movement with Black Lives Matter. There's a global health crisis with COVID-19. And in the comics industry, the further exposure of racist, sexist, and abusive practices is making huge waves in publishing structures and comics organizations. These are just some of the current events that are shaping our experiences and understanding of 2020 as a social, cultural, and historical moment. So how do you see this moment influencing or inspiring your work or your practice as a cartoonist? Let's start with Jules. Oh my, well, basically the entire crux of what I do online just as just the me product is, uh, is love Jules and, uh, and I on the back, enter the mind of a badass woman. What is that like in there? You know, everybody thinks they know us, but they really don't. They only write from the experiences of the time a badass woman stole their wallet. Like, no, that's not correct. Um, basically, my comic has always just been about, you know, it's an autobio comic a little bit, but it's more about, um, you know, surrealist commentary on, you know, social politics, you know, what the media is doing, what is going on. And yeah, I've been getting material for days ever since the Rona apocalypse started. I'm not going to lie, I'm actually kind of glad everything started bursting in flames because real talk, I was kind of sick of all that kumbaya crap with COVID-19, all right? Like, we going to sit around here and act like we're all friends when we have an entire system of abusive practices that just stomps on people because we need a color-coded caste system? Give me a whole break. No, thank you. No, so I make love jewels to comment on these very things and, you know, today, 9-11 is a very, um, you know, it's a day and a half for Americans. But there's a lot. You know, I, mean, I don't want to get all into it. I don't want to go Michael Moore on it. But basically, 9-11, a big thing about 9-11 is that a lot of American ass polary got us there. Eh, and that's what a lot of people don't want to admit. And I'm like, okay, maybe we can just finally address these issues and actually talk about this stuff. And, you know, finally stop shying away from the conversation. And that's what my work is all about. Pass. Ball. Xavier, how about you? Um, so with, with this, whole, uh, this whole thing going on with Black Lives Matter, um, COVID-19, and um, just, yeah, it really just opened the floodgates to a lot of racism. And especially with the uh, New Mutants coming out, um, it just came like there was always this thing hanging over uh, the head of the, its release and we always knew that there was going to be something wrong with it. Um, it turns out not only were there two uh, people of color that were wh uh, whitewashed, like something that's always happening in the industry, whether it's in comics and movies and TV, but uh, one of the char characters just for ed edginess became racist for no reason. and it kind of shows when uh, in this kind of uh, climate that uh, you don't give you know, people of color the reins or some sort of in control, um, it really just gets out of control out around the same time um, because seeing about the uh, race would come up with Black Lives Matter and um, just are at a, an alarmingly more you know higher rate. On top of that, we have the industry that you know it's it seems to be a big um, you know progressive uh, I don't know conversation that needs to be talked about. Lexi, what do you think? Um, yeah, I feel like. I'm more, like, everything has always sucked. I just feel like in 2020, everything that has been sucking is more visible now. Like, I've, like, no one would ever talk politics with me because I would just get so angry all the time because I look at stuff from such a personal level. But now it's like 2020, everybody's angry and everyone sees it now. It's just like, yeah, yeah, it's always been bad. Like, these, and I feel like that definitely, like, Will totally influence people's art. I'm more of like, uh, I'm a younger person. I'm not fully like developed yet. So I don't really handle all of this like in a healthy way. I don't really know, like, I can't really like, I don't know. 
I have yet to like develop a good healthy coping mechanism of like what's going on without like overwhelming me. So I try to put it in my art. I look at it and it's like, Ugh, that's a lot. And then I shut down. So it's like that me handling all this and like in the world, I just get angry and it's like, it's still like a work in process sort of thing. So like, that's all I really have. Oh, Juan, what about you? Well, um, I, I was thinking about like what Jules said, uh, especially with the 9-11 uh, stuff and things like that. And I'm, I'm from Mexico, like I grew up there most, most of my life. So for me, it was just very clear, like even when all of that was happening and different stuff, it was always very like, oh, like Americans are overreacting to getting like one attack while they're like bombing half the world over and like all of these stereotypes and a lot of these things that like are way more discussed and prominent outside of the country. And even like just learning world history, like in Mexico and then coming over here and then like going to their history classes and seeing all that stuff. I think it's definitely always been in that culture where, uh, here where it's like, like it's like the best, the, the best place ever. And like, it isn't really until like, it's more visibly inconvenient that it's more visible, kind of like Lexi said, and like, it's just that it's now inconvenient for literally everyone. So everyone has to discuss it. And I think it is one of those things where I think um, we're kind of at this weird point where like, there's, there's a lot of different topics and things, but I feel like the one that like companies and just like entities in general keep trying to avoid is just like, a lot of the class stuff like they keep trying to like get us more like focused on different issues and stuff like that while still avoiding like the general like yeah like you know like there's just mass class inequality and just you can it like kind of pours into every topic but like we just micromanage it so like you never really focus on the bigger thing so i think it's more of like that dynamic because I think like when you see the whole big thing you get very overwhelmed and I think like that's why everyone's so overwhelmed this year because it's like you kind of can't not tackle that now because it's like kind of at a point where we're like okay like if we figure out COVID then like next year it's going to be climate change and all these other things and it's kind of like a very overwhelming do or die moment and I think that's why like everyone's just kind of going through like a global trauma almost about everything. Maxi, what about you? Um, so me, I'm a pretty quiet person. I um I like to support, you know, causes and issues that I align with silently without getting recognition. <laughs> um however this this whole craziness that we're just going through has metaphorically forced my hand <laughs> to just express how I really feel about everything. Um, and it has influenced my work. Um, I, I just reached that boiling point where I can no longer <laughs> just stand quietly and support, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. And <laughs> oh, where's that going with this? Um, yeah, I'm horrible with words. I'm trying so hard to just iterate what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, this whole thing is, um, it, it just makes me, just makes me express, makes me want to express what I feel about everything going on, about COVID, about the political climate, and just everything. Um, and yeah, it, it has influenced my work, like, um, and uh, my Facebook feed is just so full of, uh, and I'm just like, <clears throat> I'm like, oh Lord, please give me the patience to not slap any of these people. Instead, I just pick up my pen 
and I'm like, screw this. I am going to draw what I feel. I am going to say what's on my mind. And if these people have an issue with what I'm saying, they can kiss my butt because I don't care at this point. <laughs> For, and um, one of the one of my works that has been affected um, is Brown Girl Awkwardness. I was I originally created it just for some slapstick fun, but it just turned into some some little political cartoons. Um, like for example, there's this panel, this last page where it said, "Us as Latinas or Latinx were seen as crazy because we refuse to take crap from everyone else." And I'm like, screw it, I'm going to say it. And if no one likes it, that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> and so far, people are starting to just enjoy my work because of it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, especially like right now um, with uh, like what um, in the comments uh, Han mentioned is that right now we're at like a seemingly big crossroads when it comes to uh, social justice and it I, I know for the longest time I've heard uh, uh, if you want it uh, you should create it and I mean granted a lot of uh, <laughs> earlier in my life I had to wait for other people to create it but now we're at a really unique uh, place where we can create it for ourselves so I, I, I like that I mean I guess a good positive of all the brimstone and fire going on right now is that it can influence our uh, our comics and artwork in a way where we can create our own spaces and be able to make these uh, Latinx uh, positive queer spaces ourselves rather than wait for someone else to make it for us. Yeah, that's great. And that actually leads into my next question, which is um, what role do you think that comics can have in creating social and cultural change? And also, what comics have you seen that you feel like have already helped and contributed? Um, let's start with one. Juan, you're unmuted, or you're muted still. I'm, I'm sorry, I think I have like a weird connection. You kind of broke up like halfway through the question. So could you repeat it, please? I'm sorry. That's OK. Um, the question is, what role do you think that comics can have in creating social and cultural change? And what comics have you seen that you feel like have contributed to change? Mm. I know that some of the creators that, like the, the creator that initially made me want to do more political stuff was uh, Joe Sacco. Uh, like he does like very journalistic, thorough, like uh, very well documented like comics about like a specific issues and and things like that but I also like uh, cartoonists like Ben Passamore and and some of like the more like on Insta on Instagram social media like very active like the NIF kind of stuff but I think I think to me is that like all of these artists like and us as creators like um, at the at the end of the day we can create a lot of like movement through conversation and things like that but i think uh like the constant fight is always that like the the dialogue is good but like you kind of have to go beyond that too so like even outside of just creating work and trying to move a conversation i think like it really is about like uh creating creating communities and trying to like just commute um do more action beyond even just comics but i think it definitely helps create and foster a community and space that help that enables that and it's just encouraging people to share ideas and to also do things beyond just comics as a creator i think is very important jules what about you ah, ah okay um, so like what, what creators inspired me? Um, um, what, what creators have you seen like in, impact change and how do you think comics can help affect change? Oh my God. So I've been following Lalo Alcaraz since I was knee high to a toadstool 
um, I, I got introduced to his comics after he started, you know, drawing comics about Pocahontas. And I was a tiny little 11-year-old girl. And I was like, I like the Pocahontas movie. But I thought the comics were, like, really hard. I was like, oh, oh this is metal. Okay. So I've been following him for a while. And uh, Lalo in calling out Mickey Mouse. Oh, snap. Okay. So let's walk back for a second. Any of you remember the movie Coco, right? Okay. So Disney tried to copyright or I, I guess trademark, they tried to do some kind of government hold on the phrase Dia de los Muertos for the movie Coco. And eh, I have never seen Disney get slapped down so hard in my life. And I grew up in Orlando, okay? They, like the response online, I was just like, signing up on the change.org signature, beep, 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 F you Disney. So basically, because of, you know, Migra Mouse and all the cartoons that Lalo made, he actually criticized his way into a job and they hired him as a consultant, which I thought was actually kind of a really cutting edge move. And because of, you know, involvement of the activist like Lalo, you know, Coco got a much better, you know, much better treatment than it would have gotten if we just left it in the hands of people who like making seven layer dip. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I said it. Um, great. Lexi, what about you? Um, I think a uh, creator, like, I know Ben Pathmore was already mentioned, like, I think he does, like, super great work. Uh, Spike Trotman and uh, just her giving other creators a platform, I think is, like, super important. Um, creators like uh, Brina Nunez and uh, uh, Bianca uh, Unis and like especially with what just happened to her with the whole newspaper syndicate like that whole situation was sort of like ridiculous I don't know like I feel like those are all creators who are doing so much right now by like telling like their stories and like the comics they're putting out there like they're slowly like building up this platform for other younger creators to come and like stand on to like just keep building each other up and I don't know, I'm just like a huge fan of like Spike Trotman especially with like her work and like how she talks about how she's fueled by spite and all of that and I don't know I just think that it's so important like how all these creators are like working together to like push these causes to make them more visible and like getting to work and like the nib and stuff yeah like I'm sort of rambling but oh uh, those are just like some that I think are really doing like really important stuff right now. Thanks, Lexi. Um, Max, Steve, what do you think? Um, what was the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm, um, still, I'm, I'm still recovering from the seven layer dip joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what role do you think comics can have in creating social and cultural change? And what comics have you seen that you feel like have contributed to change? I think comics have made a great impact on, you know, on the world, on social and cultural change. Um, I know a lot of people um, disregard comics, they belittle them, and under underestimate their influence. Um, but comics are, they're awesome. <laughs> This is my way of putting it. Um, I, I I have a lot of comics that I think have made a difference. Two of them I don't think are very well known, but um, they kind of touch, you know, what we go through today in society um, as a whole. Um, I know, um, I don't know if anyone agrees with me, but I know Love and Rockets is just one of those comics that I think has just made a, an impact. Cause you know, we get to see this whole side of, you know, a culture that, oh, what's the, how do I put it? Uh, crap, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. I don't know, it's me personally cause Love and Rockets. I love Love and Rockets. Um, I love the, the narrative behind it. And, you know, I love how, you know, both Hyman and Gilbert, you know, they, they draw these lucha women, these women that just wrestle 
um, and they're still ladylike. I'm like, yes, I needed this growing up. I didn't have Love and Rockets growing up. I'm like, but I needed this. Um, two other comics that I think, you know, they kind of touch a little bit on, you know, what's going on is um, they're both by the same creator. Um, I don't know if any of you've heard of Mirka Adolfo. Uh, she's an Italian comic artist who's worked on it with DC in the past. Um, she created two comics. The first one is Unnatural. Um, and and, I, and um, I don't know what anyone feels about anim humanized animals. <laughs> um, but in the plot, you know, in the society is governed by this government where um, same species animals are only allowed to reproduce, are allowed to get married and reproduce um, interspecies animals, and especially same-sex animals, aren't allowed to get married. And if they're caught, they're thrown into this prison-like um, facility where they're tortured, their children are taken away, and they're also educated to, you know, and they're told your parents are disgusting, they're horrible, and it's because of them you're being punished as well. And this whole society just controls everyone. Like they even have a program where after you reach a certain age, you have to go out on a date with who they think is the best fit for you to repopulate your species. And that kind of just reminds me of how it kind of is right now. You know, um, I'm not gonna, you know, say, you know what they are but you kind of get the idea um the last comic and it's called unsacred and it's also by mirica and delfo um basically the two main characters angelique is an angel and damien is a devil a demon and you would think the demons the devils are like oh bad because you know that's what we were taught but it's the angels that are the biggest hypocrites like Angelique, she marries Damien out of love because she loves him, and she gets disowned by her own mother because, oh, since you chose him and his kind over your own family, you're no, you're not my kid anymore. I disown you, and, um, and her mom's like one of the biggest hypocrites because she had a kid out of wedlock, and you're just like, dude, seriously? Like Damien's own kind accepted Angelique more than her mom ever did I don't know <laughs> I think that's about it for now <laughs> hey Xavier what about you um so a lot of uh because the, the question is in regards to like uh comics that uh, contributed to change in general so um to expand that a little bit more like uh Ava DeVinay comes to mind um you know using her uh, platform to uh, I mean, she she did a whole documentary on the Thirteenth Amendment, which was a a known uh, see, <laughs> like a, a very visible secret, um, and she like just exposed it, made it free to view. Which, by the way, if you haven't, you should. <laughs> um, but there's also um, Jorge Gutierrez, who's made so many uh, you know kid shows for us growing up when there were no Latinx uh, you know representation, but. I think for like recent years, um, there was a there was a time when Marvel was like, okay, we're gonna make a, you know representation for people of color and you know queer representation, and a lot of felt you know uh, ham fisted. But uh, one in particular that uh, that stuck out for me was Kamala Khan because it was uh, it was created by um, a a person of color. It was created by um, a uh, Sana uh, Amanat, I believe I pronounced that correctly. And because uh, it was given to someone that knew the background and was familiar with it, it feels very genuine and it was very good, um, you know, uh, comic in, in that way where like her background wasn't like the oppressor, it was just a part of her. So I, for me, that's, that's uh, you know, something that, that feels like it, it contributed to uh, comics nowadays.
Great. Um, so let's talk a little bit for a moment about stereotypes, whether they are stereotyped representations of race, sexuality, gender, ability, class. Um, what kind of changes in representation would you like to see? And how do you think that your work contributes to changes in representation? Um, so, so we're gonna start with Xavier. Sorry. Uh, uh, I, I guess that goes like goes straight from what I just said about um, like what uh, when like Kamala Khan was a really great um, like spark amongst um, misfires when it came to representation and what I personally think that uh, we we have a lot of Batman movies and we have a lot of Superman movies and we have a lot of things where like the thing that's only tweaked is the tone that they are like represented. It's never that they're man, so they must be men. But whereas when it comes to like Wonder Woman, she's woman. And so there's like very limited uh, like representation for her, but because it's like, for some reason she's, you know, kind of different in, in, uh, in her feminine, she doesn't need very much or something like that. And same thing happens when, you know, for queer representation, like we're tokenized or we're like something, we're sequestered to the background. So I guess a change that needs to happen is that we need to be pushed to the foreground and intermixed and like people should, uh, or a character should so happen to be queer or so happen to be uh, Latinx or uh, Muslim or Hindi um, rather than be their entire identity. Juan, what about you? Um, yeah, I think that's definitely a case where, um, like, we need either, we need, well, we need both of them. We need both uh, cases where we just have casual representation, where, like, we just happen to be X or Y, and that doesn't define our entire character arc. And I think the other thing is, like, whenever people write a lot of times context where it's about, our identity, it's almost always from a victimized standpoint. And I think we need to see a lot more of the confrontational representation that we can have. Um, uh, a show that I just watched recently that I really liked in that regard was uh, I May Destroy You, uh, where there's a lot of confrontational conversations in different groups. And there's a lot of like messy, complicated representation in shows like that, that I think we need to see a lot more of where you just kind of, it's, it's always seen from the point that makes the, the audience comfortable about set representation. Like, I mean, how many uh, X character that got introduced this season that got deported by ICE at the end of the season happened like this year, you know? And how many did you see about like, like, like just people being Mexican and like just being Mexican the whole show and then someone does something racist and he's like, hey, stop being racist and like just move on with your day, kind of like how your life normally is. Uh, so I think definitely that standpoint of like, if you're going to make it about race, don't just victimize us, but also uh, allow the full spectrum because a lot of it is also confrontation or talking about language or stuff like that too and just different things. Great. Um, Maxi, what about you? Okay, I was practicing this question all night. Um, this is more of a kind of also a follow up from um, the question about how the political climate affected my work. Um, some stereotypes that I've seen, I can't stand. And it just made me just say, <clears throat> F you, F you, and I don't know you, but F you too. Um, one of the stereotypes is, you know, many of the stereotypes of the Latinx community. Um, some stereotypes towards Mexicans, like I'm Mexican American, I was born here, um, but my whole family is south of the border. Um, how like, you know, we're crazy, we're victims, we're all this stuff, and I'm just like, no, we're not. I keep talking about like excuse me who who writes this I'm sorry who writes this crap and it just ticks me off to the 10th degree um especially like you know uh 
one of the comics, My Brown Girl Awkwardness, one of the the strips was um, I drew myself with my friend Brina and off panel was this jerk that was saying, oh look, two Mexicans speaking Mexican and I'm like, dude, I'm the Mexican. She's half Salvi. And the guy's like, oh, whatever, y'all still speak Mexican. And we're just like, we gotta destroy this guy. <laughs> and um, another stereotype would be the stereotype that follows plus size bodies. That, that just like, you know, we're seen as lazy. We're seen as um, unhealthy. Um, we're not seen worthy of beauty or love or respect because of our size. And it's like, who writes this stuff? Um, we're the punchlines, we're the jokes, we're the, oh, how it, we're the, the person that makes the main character look good, no matter how crappy the main character was written or looks. And we're just like, we're, I'm like, I'm done being the punchline. I'm done being all this crap just so the main character looks good, even though the main character's crap. Um, so my work, I tackle plus size positivity. I tackle, you know, what it's like being a Latina in the United States, dealing with all this crap and even some positive stuff. Um, I even tackle mental illness. Uh, me, myself, I have depression, anxiety. I, have, I go to therapy for it and I write about it. I draw it in my comics and I hold nothing back. I get deep personal with my work <laughs> and I'm not afraid to just speak what's on my mind about it. I'm like, I'm not here to make you comfortable. You don't like it. Don't pick up my stuff. It's not for you. That's your problem, not mine. Um, and another thing I also tackle is toxic masculinity. Um, cause my partner, he's, um, you know, he identifies as male, but he's, he's a little feminine. He likes pedicures, manicures. He likes to look cute. And, you know, in, in society today, people would look down on someone. Yeah. He likes being hygienic. And in society, guys like that are, you know, they're, People say stuff about that. I'm like, screw this. I'm going to add this to my comic. And he's perfectly fine with it. And um, and I'm trying not to brag here. And I hope I'm not bragging. I hope my comics are making an impact on society. I mean, I do get a lot of fan mail. And I try to answer all my fan mail as best I can. You know, from fans are like, I'm so happy you do what you do. Please continue. Um, I even had, when I went to Rose City for the first time last year, before all this shenanigans happened, I had a girl who's been going to comic cons for 10 years. She's never seen a plus size comic or a plus size artist. So she runs to my table. She's freaking out. And I'm just like, please don't look, I'm, I'm telling myself, please don't look stupid in front of her because you're just going to ruin her you're gonna ruin this image of her that you have. <laughs> and the next day as I was heading back to California, she messaged me saying, you know how hard I cried? Just looking at your work, I'm so happy you exist. And I'm so happy you're making all like you're finally, there's finally someone who's representing the plus size community, who's representing the Latinx community, and someone who's not afraid to, you know, show off their boyfriend who's like feminine, who likes stuff that a, I guess a normal human being should like. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Jules, what about you? Ah, okay, couldn't find my button. Okay. Oh my gosh, Maxie made so many great points, especially with the toxic masculinity stuff. Like, oh my gosh, yes, let us unpack this whole thing. Um, stereotypes. Woo, how much time you got. Let's talk about American Dirt. So American Dirt, if you're not familiar with the controversy, is basically Mexican stereotype, the novel. Like, white people have a problem with understanding exactly what the problem is, and I'm like, 
why are you stupid? Because to me, I just read the description and I'm like, stereotype, 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 stereotype. If it was a drinking game and you had to take a shot for every stereotype in the description, you would die. You would die. That would be the end of you. Like, and we turn that into fiction because it's basically the seven layer dip of, of tragedy porn novels, all right? That's what is going on. Karens love our flavor when it's all sad and beaten to ee Because if they understood exactly how much power we actually had, they would be terrified. They wouldn't let us clean the floor. Like, oh no, this, this, if I let you clean the floor, you might burn my house down. And I'm like, that's right, I might. Actually, there's no bite about it. I will burn your house down. And, um, and so, you know, it comes from, a ta it comes from two things a taste, a particular flavor for what makes people comfortable, like mom was talking about earlier, comfort, making white people nice and cozy and comfortable and not having to deal with <laughs> killer Latinos, you know, and, but also it's just laziness. I've worked in Hollywood long enough to know that most of the people around here are lazy. They're so lazy. They don't want to do research. I've heard people say, Oh, you know, when I would say, oh, we'd have to research X, Y, Z culture for this project, I would just heard the response, yeah, we'll just make some stuff up. And I'm like, no, don't be that guy. I'm not going to let you make me be that guy. No. Do your freaking homework. Make some friends. Talk to other humans. Why is this hard? Why? What? I'm in a safe little Zoom window. Even if I scream at you, look, just, I can't hit you. I can't hurt you. Just have a conversation. Why is this hard? That's all I got to say about that. Stereotypes are for lazy, stupid people. And you are in competition with me. I am not lazy. I am not stupid. I'm very experienced and I can take you down. The Hunger Games have begun. May the odds be ever in your favor. It, it's kind of funny too because like I remember so many times growing up watching you know a lot of like white centric uh, stuff that like you know every now and then there'll be a person of color or every now and then there'll be uh, so, uh, someone that was gay or trans you'd have to shut your brain off or something just to not get frustrated by how inaccurate or offensive it was so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up Jules because it is frustrating that it does not get uh, nearly enough like attention that they don't do their research or they don't do the conversation or include that person in the writer's room. Yeah, uh, like what they were saying, like a thing I think about a lot is that like, you can tell that, an, that a writer is bad when you can see that they're just um, kind of like reinforcing their their beliefs rather than like exposing the world to you. Like they're not really engaging with the world. They're just reinforcing like preconceived notions they have based on, instead of like just engaging with people like everyone was saying. Alexi, what about you? Yeah, it's, it's just like basically all that, like what Jules was saying, it's just like, it's just laziness. It's just do, do your research, talk to people, just talk to other human beings, talk to people who aren't white, especially like with new creators and like new people uh, coming into comics and stuff. It's so important to do your research. Take your time to just like learn and get educated. Uh, I'm going to bring up Spike Trotman again because they have a really good podcast called Dirty Old Ladies and episode eight is called Characters and they just break it down like how important it is to like give as much love and depth and attention you do to your white characters as you do to your like uh, BIPOC characters. Like it's not hard. Don't just throw them in there to be like, well, I'm the little like, like I'm the Mexican, I'm like the black person just like, just for like diversity or just like be like, yeah, I can't be racist. Look at this character. And then like you look at that character and it's nothing. They, they're, they're, they have as much like death as like a lamp and it's just like you can't you can't do that like give people like love and attention give these characters give them goals give them dreams like you're 
cutting off so much of your audience if you're not like just how hurt just imagine like i don't know i get so angry it's like another thing i get so angry about like there's children there's people of all ages they just want to see themselves like in your work like let people see themselves in media and in entertainment like i don't know it's so frustrating like show people love and affection and stuff i don't know that was sort of more of like angry rant or anything but do your research don't be lazy just like i don't know talk to more other people befriend people that aren't just white like broaden your horizons sort of thing thanks so much lexi um that also leads oh well, i'll be asking more about advice for um for budding and new cartoonists in a moment but um first um this panel is called how to change the world with a pen and so i want to talk a little bit about the act of creating what materials do you use in your work or what materials are in, do do inspire you and looking to the future what materials or methods do you want to try or learn more about so let's start with maxi um so as you can see i'm horrible with words um crap <laughs> you know creating comics um has given me a way to voice my opinions and my thoughts about everything you know especially for someone who is horrible with words who doesn't know how to express their emotions and how they feel you know about everything around them and um you know i you know, as a cartoonist, I use both traditional and digital materials. Like I, I have two desks because, <laughs> you know, my, my partner, he, he loves to spoil me and it's, you know, nine years with him and I'm still not used to it. He bought me an art desk where I can just elevate it and just draw on it without hurting my back. I have, you know, a, a regular desk for my desktop so I can do digital work when I have to, um, but the platform I prefer the most is traditional. Um, I love ink for some odd reason. There's just something so soothing, so calming about ink, and I just get lost when I'm when I'm at my desk and I'm inking something, whether with my my India inks or even my pocket brushes. Um, and my my partner and my mother-in-law, they know that, okay, she's lost in her ink. We're gonna have to give her her space and she'll come back to us when she's pulled some, well, my mother-in-law says, back from heaven. <laughs> Unless I haven't eaten for hours, or if I haven't gone to the bathroom, or if I haven't drank water, then she'll be like, ah, uh -uh, little girl, I'm gonna, you gotta go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> One of the things I would like to learn is um, more animation because I really do love animating, <clears throat> especially some of my comics. I've learned to animate those, um, but I, I know I can still work on it. And then another thing I would like to learn is risograph because um, uh, I know the first book I ever held that was from Riss made from risograph was Magical Beatdown. <laughs> <laughs> which actually was one of the inspirations for plus size girl magic and um i just love the color and how you know risograph comes out um but it's such a process from what i've heard from other from other cartoonists who use it and it's something i would like to learn so i can just you know hopefully use it in the future for my work um but in the meantime I'm going to stick to what I have. Um, hopefully in the future, I can learn more <clears throat> and share with everyone. Hopefully, you know, animate some chubby bunny in her, her, her one of billion costumes, you know, beating the crap out of depression, anxiety, and her new arch, animus, arch nemesis, 
imposter syndrome. <laughs> Great, Juan, what about you? Um, well, currently I've been doing a lot of like watercolor comics and, and with like color pencils and stuff like that. And I, I'm still, I still really want to get a lot better with that application just from seeing like other people that do it and like just making it all impeccable and it looks like they never made a mistake or something. But I think I'd also like to explore like wash and just like like more like traditional painting techniques in comics. I, I'm really drawn to those. Um, but just if I can figure out the way to do them like really fast, <laughs> just because comics are so much work. Uh, but uh, kind of like Maxi said too, like I think most cartoonists like like the concept of animation and. Uh, it's just like a fun thing to explore. So I would definitely like to do animation or a format like that, even if it's in small clip, uh, small bursts. But yeah. Great, Jules. Okay, the actual tools of the trade that I use, uh, most of the time it's digital just because that's super fast for me. I just knock off a lot of Jules in a couple of hours. Um, but also, for the actual Love Jewels novels, I actually make these marker illustrations. I'm going to put this up to the camera. We're going to talk, we're talking today about Latini Dodd. Here we go. What it's like being Latina. Uh, I made these marker inset, these uh, marker illustrations as kind of like just spot images in the book, just to kind of make it feel like a chapter cover, you know, make it feel like more substantial, you know, a little more bougie. Look how this is nice all laid out. You know, it's almost like a professional did this or something. Anyway, um, I, I'll sometimes mix in natural media stuff just to kind of mix it up a bit. Um, you know, like uh, if I'm working on other projects, like this is a character sheet. I can't show you too much of that. Uh, eh, 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 no, but that's related to a thing I'm going to do next month, which is going to make Bianca Zunis' thing look like a, a little poof. I'm just going to go, boom! Ah! It's, it's going to be bad. Um, trust me. Horrible, terrible. Um, so anyway, uh, mostly I stick with uh, digital just because it's fast, but natural media is fun for visceral reasons. Just, it feels good just to get, eh, just paint the thing on the page. You get the chalk and you get your hands dirty. I just like getting my hands dirty. Is that weird? I just, I love to get my hands dirty. And frankly, it's the best way to get your hands dirty because you don't have to actually kill anybody. You just draw comments about stabbing people. No, you don't actually have to start fires. No, that's not good at all. The sky turned orange, um, you know, here in Los Angeles. No, let's not do that. I just draw a picture of a fire and it's in a pretty safe, contained environment. I put my feelings on a page so I don't have to put them in your face. That's how that works. Thanks. Uh, Xavier. So... <laughs> I, there, oh gosh, I am so nestled in the home of, uh, of digital art, um, though it comes with a plus side uh, that I have like virtual limitless materials to use. Um, I, I've always wanted to uh, do I, um, like hand drawn like ink or colored pencil or Rizzo um, as well. It, it always it like had like some sort of price tag to it, unfortunately, but um, but the materials I've always like, I stuck to uh, is digital uh, for that fact that like there's no, there's, there is a price tag, but it's, you know, <laughs> I don't, it gives me this infinite well. And I, I definitely love using, utilizing that to be able to, uh, uh, you know, see what cool thing I can do, um, you know, without having to, you know, trek over to the Blick <laughs> to, to uh, restock or something. Lexi? Uh, I also use like a lot of like digital and stuff. I use like uh, Eclipse Studio Paint. It's like the main program I use. And sometimes if I'm feeling like adventurous, I guess, which is rare, I like just like pens and stuff. I'm trying to get, I really want to learn how to handle like nibs better and using like brushes with ink. That's something I want to work on. It's just like, a very uh, trembly person and stuff and with like 
digital, like you can shoot and you can like crank your stabilizer all the way up and no one has to know that you're just constantly shaking and stuff. So that's always fun. But yeah, I definitely want to get better at having like a steadier hand and like learning how to control like inking and like brushwork better traditionally. Great. Um, so we have about five more minutes. I have one more question. And if anyone has any um, Q&A questions they'd like to post, um, feel free to use that um, module at the bottom of your screen. Um, so as we imagine futures in which people are more involved with and in making comics, what advice do you have for a new or budding artist? Maybe one piece of advice that you would give. Um, anyone can start. Be as angry as you want to be. It's awesome. Do it. That's my advice. Uh, especially if you want, if you want to be, oops, uh, if you want to be politically inspired, uh, you don't have to just like do like the lips owning like Trump stuff. Like you can talk about any other spectrum of stuff you want. Like you don't just have to be like, wow, we really show this person X or Y. Like. You can talk about literally anything. Like I think the market is too saturated with the same subject matter. So I think you can definitely just, like there's no wrong subject. Like whatever you want to talk about, talk about it, especially if no one else is. Like, yeah. And to like bounce off of that, most definitely, like, I mean, there's, the world is not on fire just because of Trump. It's always been has just been like behind or under the rug <laughs> and not really discussed so like do a lot of no well, don't do a lot of research to the point where like you're doing more research than creating but like at least like do enough where like you're talking to the right people or you're looking at the right sources to uh to be able to uh, represent what you're uh you're creating so like if you're, uh, don't, and, oh, this is actually very important too, uh, that I'm trying to like slap my hand myself is if you um, don't, don't like feel so comfortable making only white, uh, cis, you know, straight characters for the main cast or the main character, like include like, you know, a trans character, or like a, make the, the, uh, the starring role be someone queer or someone that's uh, Asian or, Someone that is the some something you don't see very often, but don't do it without like talking to those people or including them into the creating process. Uh, don't just like free ball it. It's it can make, <laughs> make like unintentional cringy in, uh, uh, circumstances. So, like I've said, I think multiple times. I'm so sorry for that, but like bring those people into your creating process is pretty vital to make something that is very genuine and something that is matching your intentions rather than uh, cr uh, creating intentions that you did not intend. Um, a piece of advice that my mother-in-law always gives me is um, be kind to your inner muse. And then my piece of advice would be go forth and conquer. You don't need anyone's permission or anyone's approval to create stuff. It's your stuff. Don't let anyone tell you how to make your stuff. And if they do decide to butt in and tell you how to do stuff, just tell them to kiss your butt. <laughs> My advice is be kind to like, I guess like your body um, take breaks like we are in these little meat suits and stuff and they do break sometimes and you know take breaks do stretches get up from your work go on a walk take social media breaks and stuff because you are a human being and you can only take so much abuse sometimes like like just you need to make sure you always cut yourself some slack like try to work on like I don't know like nothing can be perfect even though I would love to be a person like you can't go like so yeah it's like what Maxie was sort of saying like with her advice is just like be like be kind to yourself especially during times like this where everything is pretty awful and you know sometimes you just gotta accept that 
and go on a walk and I don't know, be like, well, at least the sun is still there because so sometimes. Great. So as we close out our panel today, I want to thank Lexi, Juan, Jules, Xavier, Maxi for their contributions today. And um, before we leave and before we hand off to the next panel, um, really quick, where can our audience um, follow you and your work? Let's start with Maxi. Um, you guys can find me on Instagram under Casudo Productions. On Twitter, I'm Chubby Bunny Art because somebody took Casuto Productions. And um, I do have a website, casutoproductions.com, where you, um, because due to the pandemic, my comics are, read, are free to read on my website for those who currently can't afford to purchase them. Great. Thank you, Maxi. Juan? Um, yeah, you can, you can find me on Instagram. Um, uh, my handle is that Juan artist. Um, yeah, you can just find me through there. I'm opening my, my web shop later today too. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm mostly through there. Great. Thank you, Juan. Jules? Eh, I always have to have the mute button on the ready. Uh, okay. So. I'm typing it over into the chat where you can find my social media stuff, basically the deeds. Basically, Google love jewels. That'll get you where you need to be. I'll leave that up there for a second. Love jewels. I mean, really, if I hadn't just tapped into my meanest, would we have ever gotten a comic book cover with a woman on a surfboard with a flamethrower and a glittery mini skirt? No, that wouldn't have happened. You got to just do you really hard. That's, that's basically it. So, yeah, www.julesrivera.com. With Google, Jules Rivera, I'm the first thing that comes up. It's fine. I, I, I locked down Google. Me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jules. Um, Xavier? Hi. So um, I am kind of limited on my uh, social media presence, but I'm fixing that. Uh, so right now, um, Twitter, you can find me at RavDoodle, and my Instagram would be Rav, RavDoodleDude. Um, I have a store envy as well, which is uh, Ravdoodle as well. Um, I'll put that in the, uh, for spelling, I'll put that in the chat. But um, uh, right now, uh, right now um, I don't have a, a place for my, where you can find my comics, but I will certainly uh, update one of those two places with uh, a link or, uh, you know, a name for where you can find those. Great, thank you, Xavier and Lexi. Uh, you can find my stuff at Raged Artist on both Instagram and Twitter. I like posting like little diary comics there sometimes. So, yeah, that's mostly it. Great. Well, thank you all. Round of applause. Thank you so much for participating in this panel today. And stay tuned because um, the next panel will be starting very shortly. So I'm going to hand the...